Good afternoon and good morning to those of you that are joining us on the West Coast. My name is David Gravel and I'm a talent account manager here at Voices.com and I want to welcome you all to this webinar. Um, you're in for a great treat today as our special guest is Tommy Griffiths. Um, he's going to be sharing with us how to record a technically perfect voiceover audition and he's going to help you troubleshoot some areas that you may have encountered in the past. Um, Tommy also has a special promotion in store for all the attendees, so make sure you stay with us until the end so you can find out the details on that. So, um, I just want to take this opportunity, I'm going to introduce our special guest, Tommy Griffiths. Um, now, for more than 35 years, Tommy's made a living with his voice. Um, he's a sag after member since 1981. Tommy was 17 years old when he voiced his first commercial. And since then, thousands of projects for clients like Coca-Cola, Chevy Camaro, Harvard University, the World Health Organization, and President Bill Clinton. Uh, Tommy hosts and produces podcasts, voice tracks, and um, uh, he does this for radio stations across the U.S. And he was recently the morning host on Classic Rock WBIG in um, Washington, D.C., where he currently resides. And uh, he's now retired from the morning radio, but he works full-time as a voice talent, voiceover demo producer, as well as a voiceover coach. And he does consulting to nearly 400 voiceover artists around the world. So I'd like to welcome Tommy to the webinar, and uh, I'm very pleased to have you here today, Tommy. Thank you, David. I really appreciate that. Uh, what I'm going to do, I just want to outline the agenda of the webinar quickly and then I'm going to let Tommy take the lead from here. So uh, in the webinar, Tommy's going to go over, uh, obviously he's going to have an introduction. Uh, we're going to go over some quality control, possible quality issues, levels, acoustics, external noise, internal noise, performance issues, and then we'll have one last thing, and then we're going to finish off with a little Q&A session. So I just want to remind everybody, uh, just so you don't forget your questions. Um, if you can type them in when you think of it, it's great. I'll compile some questions at the end, and uh, we'll, uh, I'll be posting those to Tommy as we go. Um, yeah, so uh, I think that is it on my end. So I'm going to turn this over to the man of the hour. Uh, Tommy, I'll let you uh, take it from here. Thank you, David. Appreciate that. Thanks to everyone who's uh, attending this morning or afternoon or wherever you are. I'm on the East Coast in the Washington, D.C. area. I, I think some of my uh, students, I have students all over the place, are probably listening. Uh, the fact that you are actually listening to this webinar means that you are investing in your product, in your voice, your voiceover talent. And the fact that you... Uh, are here and taking the time to educate yourself about the minutia of the technical stuff it says a whole lot about you. So kudos for doing that. So what do we mean by recording a technically perfect voiceover audition? Well, perfect is sort of a relative term. I mean, how do you measure perfect? We probably should name this a more perfect voiceover uh, audition. Uh, how do we make it as good as we can make it? Because let's face it, we know how competitive this industry is. It's entirely competitive. And if you can do whatever it is to make yourself just that much better, then you're that much closer to winning the audition, getting the gig, whatever it is. So any little thing that you can do to make your uh, auditions particularly better, and this can apply to uh, the real work as well, is gonna make you more money. So we, we start with just the overall recording quality. And it breaks down into a couple of different uh, matters, your, your technical stuff, you know, regarding your, your gear, and then there's your voice. And all that can contribute to the actual quality of the sound, the product. But the one thing you need to remember, uh, if you go out there and, and buy a very expensive mic expecting that to fix all your problems or an expensive preamp or, or anything like that, uh, you got to make sure that everything is in line first before you go ahead and, and make those sort of investments. As we say in the introduction, recording quality is only as good as the weakest link in the recording chain. So if you have that $1,200 microphone, that very nice Neumann with broken insulation cord connected to the microphone, then you've just destroyed the quality of the microphone just from that. So that's what I mean by the weakest link in that chain. So what you need to do is make sure that, that everything is of quality. When you buy a microphone, 
uh, there is sort of a, a ceiling to the return on your investment. Um, after a certain level, it just doesn't matter anymore. I mean, I, I would think that 100 bucks will buy you a good broadcast quality digital microphone. You could probably you know, find a, a Blue Yeti or something like that. But after, after so much money, it just doesn't matter anymore. Then, then you're sort of toying with the ears of the audiophiles, you know, those who uh, you know, just like to collect microphones and have that kind of money, which is ridiculous. First things first, you always want to check your work. Always want to check your work before you submit it. You want to use headphones every time. Uh, you read a lot about, you know, the, the closed covered headphones, closed eared headphones and all that. That's, that's fine. Just as long as you are monitoring, monitoring, listening to your audition back before you send it out with headphones. It's imperative that you do that. Because when you, uh, when you send that audition and you've just listened to it maybe on computer speakers or cheap earbuds or, or anything besides headphones, you can't be assured that the quality is good. The headphones are the only way you're going to be able to tell if you've left a breath in between words, if you've made a bad edit, if you've clipped the S off the end of a word. So get yourself some headphones before you spend money on that ultra expensive microphone. First thing you want to do, get those headphones and be listening. Check your audition. Check it carefully because, again, you're competing with other auditions. And everything that you can do to make your audition more perfect is going to get you closer to the gig. Next. All right. Some issues that you would be listening for when you're using your headphones. Obviously, levels. The levels mean, of course, how loud you're recording and how low you're recording. Levels are imperative, imperative that you make those things perfect. And we'll get to that in just a second. Acoustics. What does the, the sound of your room sound like? Hopefully nothing. Hopefully it's dead. If there's an echo, if there is any sort of reverb, if it sounds like you're in a hallway, you got to fix that. Your performance flaws, uh, you know, popping a pee, uh, a loud breath, anything that is your fault physically. Uh, and I don't mean, you know, with pressing a button or, or turning a knob. I mean, uh, in, in a matter of speaking, if you are, uh, you know, just speaking too low or you're just way too hot, those are the things you're going to listen for. External noise, which would be any kind of environmental noise, like your dog barking. Who hasn't been recording a voiceover and the doorbell rings and the dog starts barking? That, that happens all the time around here. So you got to be careful to protect against those things. And then internal noise. Buzzes, all kinds of things that have to do with your system that you're using. So I'm going to give you an example here of what a really bad <laughs> recording environment sounds like. And, and listen for all these things that are out of whack, according to th this list of issues. So this is an example of bad acoustics, a bad environment, a lot of noise, and a lot of problems. First of all, you can hear the acoustics are horrible because of the bounce back from the flat surfaces back into the microphone. That can be easily solved by moving into a room that's been treated acoustically, is isolated from environmental noise. For example, I've kicked the dog out of the room, you don't hear his tags jingling anymore, and making sure that your levels are good. So did you hear the difference between the two? The first one had a, some noise in it. It had, uh, who knows where that noise was, was coming from, and we'll get to where those possible sources are for noise in just a second. The levels were bad, the acoustics were bad, every single thing about this was bad. Now listen again to the transition. So this is an example of bad acoustics, a bad environment, a lot of noise, and a lot of problems. First of all, you can hear the acoustics are horrible because of the bounce back from the flat surfaces back into the microphone. That can be easily solved by moving into a room that's been treated acoustically, is isolated from environmental noise. For example, I've kicked the dog out of the room, you don't hear his tags jingling anymore. All right, so you can hear the difference, and it's a big difference. And just because uh, you have an awesome voice, maybe uh, you're going to be the next Siri woman. Uh, perhaps you're the next Ernie Anderson out there. Uh, it doesn't matter if your technical issues still linger on your audition. If you have these problems, they're going to get tossed with everything else. Nothing matters at all besides these technical issues when it comes down to submitting an audition after the voice. So let's go to the next slide, David. And we'll talk about levels. Levels are the most important thing to pay attention to. And more auditions are tossed because of level problems 
than any other issue. Usually they're too low. We hear somebody talking you know, really low like this and it, it just sounds horrible like that. Or it's way too loud. People are just shouting into the microphone ready to bust, you know, bust the, uh, the diaphragm of the mic. You, uh, you really need to be careful. So how do you be careful? How do you monitor your levels? Well, there's your proximity to the microphone, obviously. There are many different uh, recording level controls in your audio chain, uh, moving from your preamp to your recording software to the uh, internal audio control in your computer. All of those things, you know, there's, there's four sources right there, have something to do with your levels. So you need to check every single one of those things. Again, uh, check inside your computer. Set the, uh, the levels in your software. Make sure that they're at a decent level. Make sure that your uh, levels going from your preamp to your PC or Mac or whatever you're using are set at a proper level. Make sure that the levels from the mic to the preamp are set properly. And make sure that the levels from your mouth to the mic are set properly. If not, then you're going to mess the whole thing up. And it's just, it only takes one thing. It only takes one compromised link in that chain to affect the audition in a negative way. So here's your magic numbers, David. Negative six to negative three, some say negative 3.3 dB are your magic numbers. Now it seems counterintuitive that the, uh, it looks like the higher the number, the lower it is, but it's actually uh, a negative number. So the higher the number, yes, the louder it, louder it is. Negative six is about as low as you wanna get with your volume, and then negative three dB is as high as you want to get. Any higher, it's going to sound distorted. You're, you got to have enough top end there. And any, any lower than the negative six, and it's just going to sound too low. Now imagine the, uh, the client or the person who is reviewing your audition, listening to these things. First of all, if they hear an audition that just sounds overmodulated like that, gone, tossed immediately. Or if they hear one, just like this, you can barely hear it at all, which many, many people submit, believe it or not, uh, that's going to get tossed as well. And then when you think about the louder auditions that come through, that pop out amongst the hundreds and hundreds that this one particular person needs to listen to, that is going to be the audition that catches the listener's ear more than anything else is, uh, you know, obviously the quality of the voice, but the quality of the audio as well. David, let's go to the next one. Bad room acoustics make voiceovers sound amateur. It sounds like when you have bad room acoustics, it sounds like you're sitting in your kitchen recording or you're sitting in your bedroom recording without any acoustic sort of uh, dampering or, or any sort of acoustic solution there. Uh, you really need to make sure that you can hear, and again, another reason to use headphones, you can hear what's going into the microphone. It's not just your voice. If you don't acu acoustically treat the room that you're in, more than just your voice is going into the microphone. What's bouncing off the walls is going into the microphone, and that's the echo that you hear. That's that sort of empty hall kitchen sound that you hear. And it sounds exactly like that, like, a, like you're sitting in a kitchen. It makes it sound very amateurish in a way. Uh, you know, like, like you are a beginner uh, when you send an audition that has those really bad acoustics. So make sure, you know, after your levels are set, that your acoustics are fine. And I'll show you how to do that right here. When you uh, walk around your room, if you clap your hands, if you believe in fairies, actually, if you clap your hands in different corners around walls and all that, and you hear that echo, that will, that will let you know when or, or where to add that soft absorbent material, whether it's a blanket or an acoustic tile. <clears throat> Walk around and, and look for things that actually vibrate as well. I found out that there was a noise I couldn't figure out for a month what that little noise was coming from. It was the register from my heating and air vent. It was actually vibrating from certain notes of my voice, certain speaking notes, and it would just hum a little bit. So I you know, just put duct tape over that. But uh, the craziest things will interfere with, with the noise. So, so walk around, uh, you know, use your hands, use that clap echo to figure out where those special surfaces are that need to be covered up. Any hard, flat room surfaces are the enemy. 
So anything, you know, a ceiling that's flat, any, anything that shines basically is bad acoustics. Uh, wall surfaces, uh, a, a floor, a tile floor especially, so rugs are good. Anything that uh, is flat is go going to send your voice shooting right back into the microphone. Especially now, think about the, uh, the statement I make, made about the expensive microphone you bought. What if you invest, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars, or thousands of dollars in a microphone, and then you work out of your kitchen? What, what good was that? It, it, it makes no sense at all. What you need to do is treat the room that you record in with soft, sound-absorbent surfaces. Blankets and foam are your friends. It doesn't have to be expensive. I mean, you can go to any of these on online outlets and buy all sorts of very expensive acoustic treatments. But if you throw a blanket over one of those uh, partition dividers, you know, one of those, uh, they're divided in threes. I forget what they're called, but you can put a blanket over that or a rug, put a rug on your wall. Uh, get one of those uh, on wheels coat rack kind of things that you would hang your laundry on after you, uh, you iron. You can put a blanket over that. Surround yourself with these soft surfaces that absorb sound. And you're going to find that the echo effect, that sort of slapback sound, is going to be cut uh, dramatically. And it's going to make a huge difference in the quality of the sound of your audition. External noise. This is, this is an easy fix. Uh, you need to find an environment where you don't have trucks driving by, sirens, dogs, kids, people walking upstairs, anything that is interfering with the sound, anything that is going into the mic other than the sound coming from your mouth, once again, is something that you want to eliminate from the audition. And those are the things that some people, believe it or not, leave in their auditions. It's, it's true. I've, I've heard them before and it just sounds silly. You hear somebody, stop. I've heard a woman yelling at her husband, when are, you gonna, when are you gonna be done with whatever he was doing, recording his voiceover? Uh, and he left it in there. You could hear little bits and pieces of that because obviously he didn't monitor with headphones to listen to those noise issues. So make sure you listen to those things and you eliminate them. Again, spend big money on recording gear, use one cheap mic cable and all your gear sounds cheap. And that's where the internal noise issue can come from. Uh, if you have a bad mic cord, any, any bad cable, um, think about what goes from your mouth to the microphone through a cord, through a cable, through a preamp, through any sort of uh, audio fix if you're equalizing, anything that goes into the PC and out the speakers, every single connection in that chain has to be perfect. Otherwise, it makes no, no sense whatsoever to spend any kind of money on, on anything. You gotta make sure that it all works well before you go ahead and spend more money on a better sounding microphone. The fix, check your cable connections. Are electronic devices nearby? That's a good one. I had a buzz every, every so often. I couldn't figure out where it was coming from. My cell phone was too close to the, where I was recording. It was, for whatever reason, picking up the radio waves from that. Often, if your uh, machine, if your PC or your Mac is running any kind of back, background program, maybe uh, antivirus software or whatever. That's going to cause some internal noise as well. Shut all that stuff off. Uh, turn it off completely. Make sure that the only thing that's running is what you need to record. And that's going to improve big time on the quality of, of the sound and any internal noises that interfere with your audition. Performance issues. And this is just a little alliteration for fun. Popped peas present particularly preventable problems. And it's not just popped peas, it's, it's breaths, it's mouth noise, it's any clicks, it's uh, nose whistling, any, any kind of that stuff that, you know, that is the human body making noise other than the voice, and you can imagine what that could be. Uh, it's something that you want to get rid of. You do not want to include any of that stuff in your audition. So make sure that you, you have a pop filter, some people call it, uh, any of those things. And there's, there's other fixes as well. But the key, again, to you need to listen for these things before you send your audition with your headphones to make sure they're not there in order to, again, make your audition more perfect. Use your pop filters. Practice. It's not just a pop filter that's going to control your popped peas. It's, it's sort of 
almost uh, inhibiting the actual plosive, the actual expiration of air from your mouth and lips into the microphone that causes that sound. So you need to make sure that you practice maybe turning your head to an angle, um, curbing that airflow that comes from your mouth as you're speaking into the microphone, and using a pop filter. Eventually, you'll find yourself uh, not even thinking, unconsciously not popping your peas while you're having just a regular conversation because that's just the way you speak. You don't pop your peas on the mic. You don't do it in real life. You can fix any vocal glitches that you find in your uh, waveform that you send as your audition by listening carefully with your headphones and using the fade function. The fade function is your friend. Uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, many times you're going to go through and you're going to eliminate breaths and noises and, and all sorts of thing, things. But the, the fade function works really well. It can You can actually, if you've recorded a really awesome kick butt audition and it's like, man, there's a popped pee in the middle of it. I can't redo, I cannot repeat that performance. If you're lucky, I, I think it works about 90% of the time. Uh, take that fade in function, fade in over the plosive part of the P. There was a bunch of P's right there. And fade in over that. And quite often that works. That will solve it. If, it, if that doesn't work, do it again. Uh, and then if, that, if you overdo it, then you want to go back, obviously. If it doesn't work, then you're going to have to re-record. But you, you should use the fade function as well when you clean up breaths. Uh, think of painting. You want to blend the sound in with the rest of your waveform. It's not like you want these abrupt sounds that actually, you know, stop. I hear a dog barking. I've got a problem. So what you need to do is uh, make sure that the sounds blend together rather than the abrupt cutoff from the sound to the, the muted sound. You want to fade, fade out. Final thing, with all these things that I've, uh, that I've explained to you between the acoustics and, and the popped peas, anything that uh, causes environmental noise, like a dog barking in the background, any sort of uh, internal noises, all those things are things that you need to listen for every time. Every time that you submit an audition before you click send, you need to listen, listen carefully, and listen at a pretty good volume too. Because if you listen at a low volume, the external noise is going to uh, overpower the, the, the audition that you're listening to, and it's just not going to make sense uh, to do that. So listen at a considerable volume. Not like you're listening to a Led Zeppelin CD, but, you know, pretty substantial, enough to, to hear any clicks or pops. And uh, finally, David, questions and answers. So high-quality studio monitors are not better than headphones for mixing. Well, it depends on what you're mixing. Uh, mixing music is completely different than listening for these sort of glitches in a voiceover audition or voiceover uh, file. Uh, mixing music is a completely different type of listening. You're listening for anything that's not your voice that's there. Anything that distracts from your voice is something that you want to eliminate. You want to get that stuff out of there and then... Uh, you know, then you want to submit it. You don't want to, uh, you know, send anything that has, a, you know, again, a dog bark or, or any kind of click or, or pop. So uh, Sebastian, I believe the name is, uh, would, you, would recording in a closet with clothes help the acoustic? Yes, it, yes absolutely. I know many, of pe many people. Uh, in fact, I know a woman who's been doing this for years and years who continues to record in her walk-in closet. And the clothes that surround her actually absorb the sound. So it works very well. Just make sure that you don't have a tile floor. Make sure you don't have a, a flat ceiling that's going to reflect that sound. You can uh, easily fix those things with uh, the ceilings, an easy fix. You can spend a couple hundred dollars on something called an acoustic cloud, which suspends from your ceiling. And it's, uh, I've got one behind me, and it just sort of hangs over my recording area and absorbs any of the sound that, that might hit the ceiling. There's also things you can buy for like 39 bucks, these, these acoustic tiles that are like three foot by three foot. You can tack them to the ceiling. Those work as well. Just make sure that all those flat surfaces are uh, covered. Paul asks, how do you determine 
what is a good mic cable? Well, Paul, you get what you pay for. Uh, and honestly, you do. I mean, you can go over the top and, and buy, you know, $100 mic cables for sure. Uh, you probably don't want to do that. But I would avoid the discount bargain bin specials. Uh, find something that's a brand name, you know, uh, Monster Cables, uh, any uh, any brand names, any any of the outlets like Sweetwater will make their own cable. It's actually these uh, high-end cable manufacturers that allow Sweetwater to uh, put their name on it. So so try some of those. Z-Zounds or Zounds is how it's pronounced, zounds.com. What's the best recording type, CD, flash drive, et cetera? Uh, what you want to do is uh, record to actually an MP3 file or a WAV file or whatever the client's looking for, and then send that file, either upload it or you want to email it. You just send it digitally without any... Uh, Debbie. Debbie wants to know, uh, what, would, what are some good mics to recommend for beginners? I typically suggest the Blue Yeti. Uh, you can go with a Blue Yeti Pro. The Blue Yeti is a mic that is relatively cheap, but it's got pretty good quality. And I and I know lots of lots of my beginner students get work, and they continue to get work using that microphone. It it's great for a beginner because it just plugs right into your your uh, computer or Mac with a USB cable. You don't have to worry about the expense of uh, any sort of mic preamp or anything. And then uh, I think the Blue Company, the Blue microphone company manufactures something called an icicle that'll boost the sound as well. I think that's only about 39 bucks. You plug the cable into that and then you plug from the icicle, I guess, into your machine. So I would go with that. Um, any, any, anything around a hundred bucks, any brand name, hundred dollar microphone, cardioid mic uh, would be good. But I, I'd start with something that's relatively inexpensive rather than jumping in head first and spending 1200 bucks on a Neumann. All right. Can you talk a bit more about how to set levels? Yes, Lauren, I can. Your levels are controlled by a number of things, one of which is how loud you are speaking into the microphone. But your microphone level is controlled by what is control what what the mic is plugged into, and that could be, you know, right into the computer or into a preamp. So, as I turn the microphone up all the way up and I turn it all the way down, that's that's my preamp right now. So that goes into the computer. And then there's a couple of things in the computer that's actually controlling your levels as well. You've got, so I'm using a PC, so I'm right clicking on the volume icon on the lower right hand side of the screen. And then I'm going to left click recording. And it, I've got a Tascam UH7000 that I use as my preamp. By the way, it's, it's an awesome preamp slash uh, converter. I'm going to right click on that, hit properties, go to levels, and then there it is. There's another, another level going in. So I set that, click OK, click OK. And then depending on the software that you're using, I like to use uh, Sony SoundForge, Sony SoundForge Studio 10. And uh, Max Fong actually wrote that. Uh, what recording software do you think is best? Depends on what you want to do. I really like the, the Sony software. It's not like a lot of people like Audacity because it's free. The Sony software is only $59 and change. It doesn't have its own proprietary, uh, you know, sort of file type. So you don't have to convert it, you know, use a special converter to go from its file type to an MP3 or a WAV file. It records in any file type you want, and it's it's not uh, <clears throat> you know anything huge like Pro Tools. Uh, you know, I think sometimes if you use you know too much of too much software, it's like using a, a sledgehammer as a as a fly swatter. It's just too much. So you know, stay within the the realm of what you're going to use, and uh, you'll be fine. So I, yeah, I like the Sony Forge. It's got the, the great fade-in. We were talking about fading over the, uh, uh, the, the, the glitches and all those things. Let's see here. Sherry writes, Sherry's one of my students in the Washington, D.C. area. Greetings, Tommy. Nice to hear you again. Can we still do consultations via Skype with you? Yes. And we'll get to that in just a little bit. 
When should you consider upgrading your mic from a USB uh, to a MIDI mic at a preamp? Paul Basker asks, and uh, Paul, that, that depends on you. If you think that that's the only thing between you and the next step in a good performance as a voiceover, as an audition, then it's time to, to add a new mic. If you can do better with your acoustics, then fix that first. If you can do better with any noise issues, fix those. Any performance issues, you know, fix those first before you invest the money. Because again, um, use this formula. Your recording is only as good as the weakest link in your recording chain. So find that weakest link. If it happens to be your microphone, if you think you can do better, then go ahead and upgrade to a better microphone. Emily asks, where would you suggest a newbie start and get into the voiceover industry? I think Voices.com is a great place to start from your home. Uh, I, I go with this philosophy. A lot of people will come to me and they'll want a voiceover uh, demo produced, and I've produced many of those, uh, like Sherry. And uh, the one the one thing that they hear is, you know, you got to take a bunch of classes and you got to, uh, you know, be proficient and and well, you do have to be proficient in in many things. But instead of taking classes, why not learn while you work? It's on the job training. Why not why not audition? with the aid of a coach, and I can help you with your auditions, uh, help you with your technique, I, I help you and coach you through your uh, your demo and the auditions to get you in there. And then when you go to voices.com, you log in, you put up your profile, and there's a, there's a good way to put your profile up. The people at voices.com are really good about helping you with that, so you maximize the number of auditions that you get. What you, uh, what you wanna do is, basically submit the stuff that we've worked on together and then start auditioning. You know, you, if you're going to be reading scripts in a class, why not read scripts and submit them and maybe one day get paid for them? I've had many, many students who have never done this before, who have surprised me. <laughs> Believe me, when you, when you hear some of their work, they got jobs. And, and it happens quite often, quite often. Uh, let's see here. Is it always bad to have any breathing sounds? Linda asks, no, not always bad. It's a natural thing. You don't want these over-the-top breathing sounds. Again, use this formula. Anything that detracts from what is being said, and this applies to your performance as well. I'll get into the performance issues a little bit. If, if your style of performance detracts from the message, if, if the way that you're talking is just so wild and freaky that it, it distracts from the message, then you got a problem. So... If uh, your breathing is just obvious and repetitive and it's, you know, there's just this constant, you know, you sound like somebody uh, on one of those CPAP machines, then you don't want to include those breaths. Uh, <clears throat> every once in a while is fine. Just don't make them obvious. You, again, use that fade button. Fade them in or fade them out and you'll be able to hear. Another good thing to do, too, is if you have a big breath and you want to leave it in but just sort of diminish the breath a bit. Find the middle of the breath and, and cut, cut about a third of the middle out, the middle third of the breath out. And then the breath just sort of fades in and fades out real quick. And it makes the breath go by that much softer, that much faster, and that, that much more naturally. Monique wants to know, is it better to send WAV files or MP3? Technically, WAV files are better quality sounding and I think it would take a real audio file to be able to discern, discern the difference between a WAV file and an MP3. What determines whether you're going to send a WAV or an MP3 is basically what your client wants. They're going to define for you the file type that they want, whether it is a, a, a WAV file, MP3. Uh, there are probably 40 other types of files. People who uh, <clears throat> record sound for film use a totally different format. So you want to... Uh, you want to make sure that you're recording what the client wants. But again, uh, a WAV file is actually uh, better sounding than the MP3. James writes, what preamp would you recommend for someone on a budget? Uh, depends on the budget. You can, you can buy a preamp for a few thousand dollars. This Tascam UH-7000 preamp that I use uh, at one time was about 800 bucks, and it's dropped precipitously down to 
about 300 and change now, 330, 340. Uh, it's a great machine because not only is it a preamp, but it's an audio interface, which means you can plug uh, a microphone like a Neumann in. It has the, the phantom power on it, so it powers up your mic. The mic plugs into that. It works as a preamp, and then it has software on it so that I can change, for example, I can change the, uh, the sound of my voice. I'm just clicking, uh, that's a little exciter. Here's the EQ, using the limiter, the low cutter. All this stuff I'm doing just by clicking buttons. Uh, and it's pretty cool. I'm, I'm messing around with the EQ a little bit now on this thing. And this is all part of the Tascam UH-7000. So you can process your waveforms, your wave files, your auditions, any way that you would like, uh, just from this beautiful little package they call the Tascam UH-7000. So let me get out of that thing. Okay. Can I use the Audacity software? Yes, you can. But you have to make sure that you convert it from their proprietary platform, whatever it is, their .au, to an MP3 and or a WAV file, whichever uh, the client looks for. Would you, rem would you recommend the Chaotica Eyeball? The Chaotica Eyeball is a pretty cool device that cuts down on acoustic noise, uh, on, on slap back from any of these flat surfaces. It's, it's a big ball that sort of fits over the microphone. I've, I can't really answer that, Gabe. I don't know. I've never used it. But from what I understand, they're selling a heck of a lot of them. So that, that must mean something. What is the best sample rate for recording? Uh, the standard is at 44,100 44, hertz, 16-bit, and I prefer mono. You can send stereo, but mono is just much easier to work with. So go with your... 44,100 hertz, 16-bit, mono, and then remember your, the numbers for your levels while you're writing numbers down right now. Your negative 6 is your lowest for your recording level, and negative 3.3 .3 as your highest. Okay, good question. How can I avoid the sound being too bass-heavy in the room I'm recording in? I experienced some rooms being overly padded out, which made the sound having an emphasis on bass. Um, boy, I don't, I don't know what you're hearing there, Sebastian, as far as bass goes. The sound should be pretty dead. Now, there are things that you can add to the room called bass traps. I have them in this room. They go into the angles of the, the walls, and they, it absorbs the bass sound, and uh, that should control it. Uh, pay attention to uh, the processing, too. Maybe it's just not equalized properly. Maybe that's why you are having some, uh, some issues with the bass sound. <clears throat> Do you think it's crucial to thoroughly warm up your voice, your throat, body, in order to get blood? Yes, Max, absolutely. You need to warm up. Uh, Do you ever hear your voice when you roll out of bed? I mean, that, that is the ultimate, that's a, the extreme example of what your voice sounds like when it's not warmed up. So you want to make sure that your voice is, is used, that you <clears throat> get those Vocal folds nice and, and moist. You drink a lot of water. You uh, keep your, your mouth moist as well. And that's what's going to help with avoiding a lot of mouth clicks and sounds. Any of these moisturizing, moisturizing mouth sprays. I have this uh, Oasis spray right here that I just used. And it works pretty well. Also, uh, while I'm beating on the, uh, the uh, bandwagon here, these TheraBreath mouth wetting dry mouth lozenges work pretty well as well. Work pretty well as well. Uh, again, TheraBreath mouth wetting dry mouth lozenges. They're good on your throat. They're good for the mouth. Um, and there's something in them like xylitol or something that, that really affects the salivatory glands and, and suddenly your mouth is just juicy. Okay. Um, I've noticed that your recording voice is slightly different than your normal conversation. What are some ways to figure out what your recording voice should be? Well, your recording voice depends on what project you're doing. Um, it depends, again, and this, this is how I would coach you. Uh, Jeff is your name. Uh, when you, this is sort of off the topic, but when you get a script, the, there's a couple of questions you want to ask yourself. First of all, what is the message in the script? 
What is it that I'm trying to say? Who am I speaking to? Who are the people that I'm speaking to? Is it a group or is it an individual? When you speak to a group of people, you to totally speak in a different way than you do when you're speaking to an individual. If you're standing in an auditorium speaking to a mass crowd, or if you're sitting in an office talking to three or four people, what is the, what is the situation that you're in when you're saying these words that's in the script? Uh, every detail that you, that you define in your mind, in your mind's eye, when you're delivering that script is the best way to define how it is what your, quote, recording voice should sound like. It's not really your recording voice. It's, it's you know, the appropriate tone or voice that you use when you're recording a certain script or project. Is a cloud lifter a duplication of a microphone preamp? Am I duplicating work by increasing gain through the cloud lifter and then a mic preamp? Good question, John. Uh, I've tried the cloud lifter and I know it doesn't work on every microphone, but it just depends. Uh, the, the way to answer that question is to listen. Do you hear a difference? If you don't, then you didn't need the, cl the cloud lifter. If it, if it improves your recording, then absolutely. Uh, if it worsens the recording, then obviously you don't want it. But you want, to, uh, you want to make sure that you need it before you buy it. That's for sure. What do you think of GarageBand as a recording program? I have many students who use it, Diane. I don't know specifically how user-friendly it is. Uh, but again, many of my students use it all the time and submit work that way and have had no problem with it. A microphone question. I've been doing work on voice.com and audiobook recordings for a few months now with fair success. Good, Zach. Everyone swears by large diaphragm mics. But I seem to have better luck with my small condenser mic. Any thoughts? Zach, whatever works for you is what works. <clears throat> Don't let anybody tell you this microphone's better. Because you know. You know your voice intimately more well than anybody else does, Zach. So don't let anybody tell you what mic to use. Have you tried the large diaphragm mic? And uh, have you tried a ribbon mic? Have you tried uh, a tube mic compared to the small condenser mic? Are you sure that that's the best mic for you? If you have and you can answer, yeah, then, then that's what it is. So again, test the mics and that's the best way to find out if, if they're the best mic for you. What is the most common or preferable ways to transfer files with Studio's clients? Well, it depends, Alan, on what you are uh, submitting and who you're submitting for. Quite often, uh, it's just a, an upload sort of deal, like with Voices.com. Uh, often, it's uh, emailing a client. If the, the file is too big, if it's a WAV file, for example, you know, the quality of the WAV file, as I said earlier, is better, but it just eats up so much memory. It, it's just such a large file that you got to use a, an FTP, a uh, file transfer protocol like Dropbox or uh, you know, any of those Google Cloud type things uh, to make sure that you get the file to the client in good time. I've heard that auditions can be recorded from an iPhone app. Do people get work using this method? How do you make sure an audition recorded via iPhone is viable? Lauren, good question. Uh, I, I have a feeling that it's probably not going to be the best quality. It's going to be digital quality, of course. But again, you know, as I had stated, stated at the, the top here, it's very, very competitive. This whole thing is extremely competitive, and you want to do whatever you can do to get the best performance out of you and the, the best audition to the client because cutting corners isn't gonna isn't gonna work for you. Uh, using the uh, the iPhone or, or any sort of smartphone for practicing, I I think is great. Uh, quite often, my students, you know, while they're waiting for their new mic to come in or or whatever, uh, they're on vacation. You know, just practice with your your phone and, and listen back. Uh, listen, record, listen, record, listen, record. Because after all, you know, we can't hear ourselves. We think we can. We hear what uh, is vibrating in our bones and tissue and, 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 and all that uh, in our head, but we can't hear what it sounds like to other people when they hear our voice going through the air and then into their ears. Completely different. So how do you monitor and modulate a voice that you can't hear? Well, you need to record and listen, record and listen, and preferably with a coach. 
Ken wants to know where he buys his, buys the UH seven thousand or other equipment to get started. You can buy it at uh, any high end store. You can get it at Guitar Center. You can get it at Sweetwater. Uh, you can get it at Zounds Z Zounds. Uh, any of those places. Go ahead and uh, I'm sure it's available on Amazon. Most of this stuff is available on Amazon. I live in a studio, no bedroom and relatively small closet. Is it feasible to prepare a corner of the apartment or should I invest in another location? Uh, yeah, you can you can work from anywhere just as long as you get those flat spaces covered. Use blankets, use acoustic foam that you can buy from any of these outlets that I've been talking about. Uh, whatever it takes, you know, it, it doesn't have to be pretty. It just has to sound good. That's all. It doesn't. You know, who cares what the studio looks like? If you're uh, you know, recording under a bridge someplace and the acoustics are fine, then, then God bless you. I'm glad it's working out for you. Uh, let's see here. If you're lucky enough to book a job, is the actual voiceover recorded in your home studio or do they have you come to a studio? Diane, most of the time uh, and recently, as of late, I've been doing my work from the home studio. It's just as good as the... Uh, the studio, uh, you know, out there on, on, on the street and with technology available the way it is today, people uh, can direct you via Skype, via phone patch, via, you know, Internet protocol, any of the, the things that are available. Uh, <clears throat> there's plenty of them, Source Connect, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so most of the, the work that you do is probably going to be done from home. And let's see, how do you feel? Final question. How do you feel about mic isolation boxes from Marxists? Uh, from Marcus. They can work, and you can actually make them yourself. There's do-it-yourself videos available on YouTube. You take a, like a plastic bin that you get at, uh, you know, say from Target, cut the long end bottom of it off, set it on your table, and then you line the inside of it with foam, and then you... If you have a tabletop mic, especially like a Blue Yeti, it works very well. You set it around the microphone, and then it will uh, actually cut back on a lot of the, the echo and a, a lot of the, the acoustical problems that you might have if you're recording from a, an acoustically bad environment. So that is that. So David. <clears throat> that was awesome. I, I learn stuff every time I do one of the, uh, the webinars. Uh, and it's great when I've got a coach like you that's really shedding some light on stuff for everybody that's uh, here in attendance. And, um, you know, it's great that we get to offer these things um, to our members of Voices.com. Uh, yeah, and Tommy, this, this has just been awesome. I, I want to thank you very much um, for your time and uh, just sharing your knowledge with us. Um, it, it's been great. And uh, I want to thank everybody that has attended, um, even if you're listening to the recorded version. Uh, I'm sure everybody has, uh, has found this uh, useful little uh, bit of information. And if anybody, as Tommy said, is looking for, um, uh, you know, to explore a little bit more coaching or, or some uh, um, tips on, you know, what they're doing for auditions, um, you can either contact him um, or myself. I'm a, I'm a talent account manager here at Voices.com. I work closely with the coaches. Um, I love doing these webinars to kind of keep everybody in the loop and uh, do some ongoing education. And uh, if you've got any questions about Voices.com, please feel free to, uh, to reach out to me because um, I'm here to make sure that everybody can be as successful as they possibly can. So uh, again, Tommy, thank you very much for, uh, for joining us today. And um, this, has been, uh, this has been a blast, and I'm, uh, I'm sure we'll be doing uh, another one in the future. So Great. I look forward to it. And anyone that uh, is interested in, in coaching, maybe you need a demo done, any sort of anything, uh, you know how to contact me for sure. Thanks again. Everybody have a great day.